Folks, I don't care what you're going through. Jesus is going through it with you. Okay? My Bible says in Hebrews 13.5, he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Doesn't matter how bad the news is. Doesn't matter how even doctor says. Uh, you, you know, uh, I'm believing doctors. I believe in medicines. But I believe more in the healing power of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, yes, go to the hospital. Go to the doctor. But man, go to a prayer meeting also, would you? Just bathe it in prayer, and we have seen the healing power of God uh, in our lives. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we're going to finish up chapter 2. Uh, it is the fourth church of the seven in the book of Revelation. And if you just read the title, you know this is not going to be pretty. <laughs> All right? The corrupt church. Well, folks, I would hate to think that our church would have a nickname of the corrupt church. Folks, there's something wrong spiritually with us. And there was uh, just truly sin in the church. And, and people were allowing uh, people to do this. And God has the, it really, he just scolds them uh, for what was going on. And uh, the two things that stick out in my study of this was false doctrine. They were not teaching and preaching the Word of God. And number two, immorality. Immorality. And we're going to discuss those two things. But if you have your bulletin, follow along with me. Uh, the corrupt church, number one, Jesus' compliment. Have you noticed a pattern of Jesus? He tells a good thing, he lets the hammer down, and then he encourages you at the end. All right? And so uh, that, that is a good thing. Uh, Jesus' compliment. Number two, Jesus' criticism. Okay, criticism. And folks, there is constructive criticism, all right? And I think that's what Jesus was trying to do, get them to see. A lot of times, we aren't seeing what Jesus sees. We don't take it and we don't interpret it like Jesus does. And here's the key. It's the Word of God. My Bible says the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This world is trying to change the Word of God and change our family values, and we as the church cannot compromise what the Word of God says. Right. We will not compromise. So it's so important. And number three, Jesus' challenge. And folks, I don't know about you, but I always like a challenge. When somebody tells me I can't do something, now... <laughs> Now, my age now, I'm beginning to wonder, all right, if I can do. You, you can challenge me, and I'll have to say, let me think about that. But I am telling you, when I was 30 to 35 years old, I, there it wasn't a challenge. One. I mean, we would take it on, and we would run with it. But, folks, the key here is the challenge is from Jesus. So if he challenges you, listen to me. He'll give you the strength and the wisdom to see it through. Folks, it's never been about you. It's never been about me. It's about Jesus. You know, the city, city of Thyatira was founded in, uh, uh, founded in 300 B.C. by Alexander the Great, which we mentioned last week. The letter to the church in Thyatira was the longest of the seven letters. The city of Thyatira was, a small, was small in population compared to other cities, it was built uh, on a relatively flat ground, which made it much easier to attack and conquer. Thyatira had been destroyed and rebuilt several times. It was a commercial center known for its producing of colored wool and dyed goods. There were uh, working guilds and labor guilds there, and uh, those there had just their own little thing going, and if you did not follow them, they would kick you out in your friendship and they would uh, not buy your goods, and they wouldn't even have anything to do with you. So again, we have the world trying to, uh, you know, root out the Christians. There were not a lot of temples there, but they did worship Apollos, which was the sun god. Many believe that Lydia, a seller of the purple fab fabrics, who was saved under the ministry of Paul, helped start the church there. The church was smaller in size, but grew later on, it was really challenging to be a Christian because of the pagan influence and worldly values. This time in history has been known even as the Dark Ages. Let's look at the church of Thyatira 
in our scripture text and see the things from the eyes and the heart of Jesus. And folks, I will say this, in, in a spiritual way, we are living again in the dark ages. Satan is having a heyday. He is everywhere, everywhere. He's on television, he, he's on the radios, he's in people's minds, he's in people's hearts. And I'm just telling you, we as the world have to keep ourselves separated from worldly values. So let's look at Jesus' compliment and to the angel of the church in Thyatira. And remember, he's talking to the church, all right, to the church, and he also is talking to us individually. These things says the Son of God. Now, there's two terms that is used a lot in using Jesus. One is the Son of Man, and the other is the Son of God. And when you see the Son of Man being used, it is showing Jesus' hum, hu, uh, humanness, okay? It's him when he came down in human flesh. Folks, when, when, he, when he was hurting, okay, physically, when they were pulling his beard out, he felt that, okay? He was 100% God and 100% man. He died on the cross. He felt every bit of that. But when you see the Son of God, it speaks of his deity. Even the Bible tells us that he was one with God. We, as Southern Baptists, believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, God who created the world. And by the way, it was creation. In the beginning, God did create the earth. And we believe that. We believe the Bible from cover to cover. And Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin, that's so important, that is so important, folks. The Holy Spirit, he placed the Holy Spirit inside of Mary. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross, he died for our sins, and after three days, he rose again. And we have a God, the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, if you want to read that. And when you get saved, I'm telling you, God places the Holy Spirit inside of us. You youngins, two weeks ago, Wednesday night, when you said amen to that prayer, the Holy Spirit entered your life. And the Bible says, who has eyes like flames of fire and his feet like brass. And we know the descriptions, and we'll be looking at this later on in Revelation also. But when it talks about flames of fire, folks, we're talking about judgment here. Okay, judgment. I mean, the ultimate judgment is death. Folks, hell is real. There are people going there. And I am saying judgment is what he is speaking of here and his feet like fine brass. And again, when you think of feet, I'm telling you, he is going to stamp out Satan and the demons, the Antichrist. There's going to be a battle, and I am telling you, Jesus will reign eternally. Victory is in Jesus. Verse 19, I know your works. Now, he lists five things here, five things that the people of... And again, folks, it's like all churches. Not everyone is doing this, okay? But these ought, to, these ought to be goals of our Christian life. Even though it wasn't a large congregation at this time, and, and even though it was a pagan world, there was a group of people in the church at Thyatira doing the right thing. There were a lot of them doing the wrong thing. There were a lot of them letting the world influence them, and I'll, I'll, you'll see that in my second point. But these folks were doing the right thing. Number one, works. What is works? It's working for the Lord. And folks, we, we aren't saved by our works. The book of James tells us if we are saved, our works will follow us. So we need works for Christ in our lives. We should be working for Christ, and there was a group of people doing that. Love, we know what love is. I met a gentleman just a few minutes ago, and he came in, and I'm not trying to point the guy out, I'm not looking, but he, he simply said, this was one of the friendliest, first time visitor churches I've been in. He said he'd been to several churches. You know what that is, folks? That's love. That's love. Can you imagine a person 
coming here the first time and not knowing a soul. What are they looking for? A place to be. Folks, we need to love everyone the way Jesus loves us. Service, that's ministry. All of us, that's why we have our new members classes coming up. So you can know all the ministries that we have and you can find a place of service. And it, and it says also faith. It, we have to have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then patience. And again, some of us, we need to work on patience, okay? We, we sometimes, we are some of the most impatient people because we live in a busy, busy world. But patience is not just being patient. It's perseverance in times of trouble. So he says these five things are in your life. I can see that. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. And again, y'all have grown into that. Folks, we should not be spiritually where we were a year ago. Every year we should grow on the Lord. Every year that we are born, we should be closer to the Lord. And he is commending them for doing that. 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, look at this. I want to give you another list. That was from John and from Jesus. This is one from Peter. Peter was the head of the disciples. 1 Peter 1. No, no wonder. I am in 1 Peter. Let's try 2 Peter 1. <laughs> Just holler at me every once in a while. It's that brain fog I keep hearing about. <laughs> 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied at you in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What is he talking about? What is his divine power? It's the Holy Spirit, folks. You have been given the Holy Spirit. Every question, you, God will answer, and he'll answer it through the Holy Spirit, through prayer, through reading the Word of God, his divine power, to godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. He personally called you out, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Folks, I hope you know that you are a child of the king. You are his son. You are his daughter. We, he is our heavenly father. He didn't leave us and just says, hey, buddy, I hope you make it. He gave us the word of God. But one of the problems is we don't spend enough time in the word. The more time you spend in the word of God, the more wisdom you will find, and wisdom is the knowledge of God. It's knowing God and knowing God's will for your life. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through its lust. But also for this very reason, uh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. What's virtue, folks? It's more morals. It's doing the right thing when nobody is looking. To virtue, knowledge that is reading your Bible and studying your Bible, to knowledge, self-control. We need to control our lives. To perseverance, godliness. We need to be Christ-like. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Have you noticed the two different things in Paul's writing and Peter's writing? It's not that it's right or wrong, but what did Paul always, in, in first, or first thir uh, uh 1 Corinthians 13, a whole chapter on love. And love started the sentence in those where, Paul, or where uh, Peter is saying, hey, let's end the sentence in, in love. Why? My thought was so we would remember what he said. And so we see we need these characteristics in our daily life. So we see Jesus complimenting them. But here we go, folks. Jesus also criticizes them. Look in verse 20. Nevertheless, and you can put the word, it's kind of like, you know, uh, when your boss calls you in and say, man, you're doing a great job, but, <laughs> okay, 
I don't know if you've been there before, but I have. All right, he gives you the good news first and then lays the hammer down. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Now, few is three or more, folks. It's not one or two. It's three or more. Because you have allowed that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And again, we see the name Jezebel there. And if you know the word Jezebel, it's an Old Testament story. It was the wife of King Ahab. And folks, I'm just telling you, you don't want the name Jezebel. Don't name your kid, your daughter Jezebel. It is not a good thing because she was wicked. She was mean. She was hateful. She was a murderer, okay? I mean, if you got on her bad side, you did not live. And really, she was controlling Ahab. If you read in 1 Kings, her life, okay? It was the most vile and wicked woman listed in the Bible. So what is it saying? I don't think the lady's name in the church was Jezebel. I think Jesus was given an illustration of how wicked this woman was, okay? And she was against everything that God was with. And somehow she got her place into the church. And, and folks, uh, we have to watch. We have to watch, you know, people that come in, all right? If we, if we see that they are astraying, we must. If they are teaching the wrong thing, it's not something you sweep under a carpet and say, hey, we'll deal with that later. We've got to nip it. We've got to do it now. We got to say, thus saith the Lord. So notice the wording here, calls herself a prophetess. And so she basically said, I'm equal with the pastor or the leadership of this church. And folks, I know what the Southern Baptists say. Matter of fact, I'll show you what the Southern Baptists say. Uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2. I want you to see two verses. We do not believe women should be pastors or deacons according to Scripture. Now, they can lead. They can lead a ladies' Bible study. I thank God for them. I thank God for our ladies who are godly teachers. But as far as leading the church and pastoring the church, and again, I know there's other denominations that do that. That's their business. That's not our business. Our business is to take care of us and line up with the Word of God. Look at verse 12. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Okay? So, again, she can teach, but not... I mean, if it's a couple's class, it needs to be a man teacher. Now look at verse th or chapter 3, verse 2. And a bishop or pastor or leader then must be blameless and the husband of one wife... Well, folks, she, she, Jezebel, she can't line up with that. It's not a husband of one wife. Temperate, sober-minded, with good behavior, hospital, hospitable, and able to teach. And then it goes all the way down through there. And so Jezebel wormed her way in and said, today I'm in charge. And the people let it happen. That is the sin of the church. And then it says... Her, her things was to teach and seduce. Folks, we know what seduction is. And she said it's okay to have an affair is basically what she was saying. And there was two thoughts to that. One of them was she excused it by saying, well, I'm really a Christian, and if I, just, if I want to do something, I can do that. And then later on, uh, I'll ask for forgiveness, and I'll ask God to forgive me. You know what that is? That's a disgrace to grace. That's, you, you are giving yourself a license to sin. And you should never justify sin. Fornication is wrong before marriage. Adultery is wrong. And she says, if it feels good, do it. Well, folks, that is not a good thought. And then the other part, not just immorality, uh, it was, uh, you know, things sacrificed to idols. She made, and again, was promoting you know, pagan practices in the worship of idols, the worship of idols. Matter of fact, Jezebel, that was her biggest deal in the Old Testament. She turned the heart of the people to Baal. 
Now look at verse 21. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Folks, I am telling you, if you are saved, then the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin. And you are the one that has to decide. Nobody can repent for you. Nobody can decide for you. And I know there's, uh, you know, Old Testament, I mean, King David, I mean, he did the two biggies. He committed adultery and he committed murder. But yet, beforehand, God, God said he was a man after God's own heart. It doesn't mean that you can't fall back and slip back into it, but I'm telling you, you can't live with it as a Christian. You can't hide it as a Christian. If folks know it, and folks, we don't do this anymore. I, I couldn't tell you the last time I've heard of church discipline. It is going to the person, and the reason you go to them is because you love them, and they are doing wrong, and, you, and they won't confess it. They won't admit it. And folks, it hurts the church in the community when people hear a Christian in the church are doing these things. So they're saying, and I know it's not a popular thing, but folks, read the red letters. This is Jesus, okay? And I'm, I'm, as your pastor, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do, I like this. I just thought of something, Steve. I'm going to do the red thing. The red thing. I'm going to do what Jesus says. Now, it isn't bringing them in here and putting them before everybody and embarrassing them in front of everybody. Read Matthew chapter 18. I'll go to them at first, my own self and say, it has been said. And, and, and here's the other thing while we're on it. If you are the one accusing, you need to be able to testify against that. If I go to them and they just simply say, I, you know, I'm not doing that, then I'm going to get you and we're going to go together. That's what the Bible says. Okay? So God gave her a chance to repent. You know what she did? She shook her faith, fist in the face of God. Boy, you're, you're on dangerous ground when you start that, folks. You, are, you either are not saved or God's fixing to take you to the woodshed. Okay? Look what it says. Sexual in my, she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Now, this is not the great tribulation that is at the end that we will be talking about I'm telling you, God will put you through things. God will make you think you're at the great tribulation time. He's not going to let his Christian children get away with it. Be sure your sins will find you out. And it says, unless they repent of their deeds. Now look at this. I will kill her children with death, and all the church shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I know what somebody says right there. What kind of God would kill children. Well, he wouldn't, folks. He gives everybody a chance to be saved. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Jezebel, because of your uh, influence, because of your example, because you won't do the right thing, your children could go to hell. Man, that's rough, folks. I mean, we know Jezebel, I mean, she didn't repent Matter of fact, you talked about tribulation. Remember Elijah told her? She was chasing Elijah, and Elijah in his weakness, and just, you know, he was, he was running. And, and he even said, folks, I understand depression, okay? He literally said, God, if you just kill me, I'd be better off. But you know what God told him? I'm not through with you yet. I still got a message I want to deliver to Jezebel. You tell her that she's going to die a, a hard death, and dogs will lick her blood off the ground. And read the rest of First Kings, folks. That's exactly what happened. Someone threw her off a building. She splat there. Dogs became and just ate her. Matter of fact, read the word. It said the only thing that was left was her head and her hands. And they dogs licked the ground. Everything that God said was true. And you say, my man, you're being harsh. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, folks. We need to check our own lives. God is giving us a chance to repent, and we need to repent. Now look at the last part of that, and I will give each one of you according to your works. So he's saying, 
Hey, I'll be fair. I promise you. Folks, God's not going to cheat you. God's got the record. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Revelation tells us he's got everything we've done written down in a book. So we see Jesus' criticism. 1 John 2. 1 John 2. Just go back a few chapters. 1 John 2. Love not the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Folks, I'm just telling you, if you can live a life of sin, life of sin, it doesn't say you wouldn't sin. Folks, we all sin, but we are convicted of that sin, and we do business with God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So he gives you a way out. He gives you a way out of temptation. Then he tells you to repent. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not him. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh. It's all over TV. I don't want, I, I, watch, I watch sports, and I'm telling you, the commercials these days are ridiculous. All right, what are they doing? They're putting a skinny girl on, you know, half-dressed to sell products. You know, when commercials start, I've got, I've got my remote in my hand. And what I always do, I always go to the channel I want to be on, and then I go to another channel so that if there's something on there that I don't need to see, I'm telling you, I hit the, that, that button and recall so I won't see that. Folks, you know where the battle begins? It begins in our minds. Satan is trying to plant something in your life a glimpse, men, a glimpse of a woman. He wants that in your mind. God says, man, you, see, I believe with all my heart, if King David would have left that porch, went inside and said, God, God, I, I saw something. I saw Bathsheba bathing, and God, please take that image away from me. It would have been a different story. And this is what this verse says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And these are things Satan puts in front of us. It's not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. Look at this. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. Oh, folks, we got good news. You, number one, you don't have to give in to temptation. Number two, you are much better off when you don't give in to temptation. So let's see Jesus' compliment, Jesus' criticism. And the last thing is Jesus' challenge. Verse 24. Now I say to you, into the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. What is, what is he talking about? The depths of Satan? Satan will do anything to make you fall as a Christian. He'll use anyone. He, he, you, he'll use close people to you. He'll lose your, he, he can, Satan can use your family against you. Satan can use Christians against you. Satan can use, and you just fill in the blank. There are no rules when it comes to him. He just wants you to fall. And what he is saying there, Jesus, and, and he's saying here that, hey, even in all this that is going on, I will not give you more than you can handle. I will not give you another burden. If you'll just do the right thing, it will be okay. Verse 25, but hold fast to what you have till I come. Why? Because these Christians in Thyatira were being persecuted. These uh, Christians were being isolated and ostracized. The business people would not use them, and they would try to drive them out of business. Even family members would disown them because they had become Christians. Even persecution, physical persecution, was on this church. And, and he says, hey, hold fast. I'll take care of you. Verse 26, and he overcomes and keeps my work until the end. To him I will give him power over the nations. See, we may not get our reward now, and what everybody wants is instant gratification. You know, we want our reward now. Well, folks, you have one of two choices. You can get it now and not get, get it later, 
or you can just, you know, not look for it and be depositing heavenly blessings for later on. Matter of fact, folks, the Bible says if you give a cold cup of water in Jesus' name, you will be rewarded. So it is to come. And again, he is talking future here, the power over nations. We don't have time. We'll talk about it later. The millennial kingdom, the thousand year of reign, uh, I'm telling you, we will rule with Jesus Christ. And he shall rule with them with a rod, uh, a rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like the potter's vessel. He will destroy when Jesus comes back, I'm telling you, after the, the end of the tribulation, he will destroy everyone in his path. We will come within. And as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. There's two things I think of when I think of the morning star. Number one, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is the morning star. He is that first star that you see. Matter of fact, folks, he's the only star. He is the star, folks. And you know what the other morning star is? The, not just Jesus Christ, but we are reflectors of the morning star. Men, when you're right with Jesus, when you do the right thing, your light will shine before men so that they can see your heavenly Father. We don't do it for saying, look at me, look what I've done. Look what I've done. We say, look what Jesus has done through me. Great song. What he's done, Steve. What he's done. We don't deserve salvation. That's right. We don't deserve this building. We don't deserve a perfect life. We really deserve hell because of our sin. But what has he done? He has given us salvation. Salvation. Is that enough? It's enough. First John 4. I close with this. First John 4. Please go back and read this. I'm going to have to read it quickly. Beloved, talking to Christians. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Folks, if something smells bad, it's probably bad. If something looks bad, it's like a skunk. Okay, if it stinks and it sprays, it's a skunk. All right? Sin is a skunk. Remember that. Test the spirits, whether they are of God. And there's only a two-part test. Does the, what does the Word of God say about it? What does my spirit say about it? And if the Word of God or your spirit says, no, I don't think you should be doing that. I don't think this is right. I don't know what. Folks, there are people that are on TV. I'll watch them for three minutes, and I think, Oop, I think I'm going to change the channel here. I don't know them personally, but my spirit just says, they're putting on a show here. Folks, we're not here to entertain. We are here to preach the Word and sing the Word and get right with God and worship up a God that is worthy of our worship. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. They're everywhere. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. It better be about Jesus. He better be preaching about Jesus. And it says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Well, Jesus was a good man. Well, in the first place, he wasn't just a good man. He was a great man. But that's not the point. He was the divine, perfect son of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. And boy, we're going to be talking about the Antichrist. I'm telling you, he's alive. He's breathing. He knows what he's doing. He has been used by Satan. He is lining himself up. Folks, what do you think the one world uh, uh, dollar, the one world money system, why do you think that's lining up? There are just so many things that they're trying to do. I'm just telling you, we're playing right in the hands, and he'll do it through the internet. Eventually, we'll have these little chips in our wrist, and you ain't chipping me. They can come and say, 
do you get a chip or we're going to throw you in jail? And I said, well, I hope I get, you know, a, a, you know, a bed and three hots, I hope, because you ain't chipping me, folks. He's already in place. The plan is there. And if we are not careful, we are going to be deceived. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which I now heard was coming and is now already in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist is already here, but I'm telling you, he is alive and well right now. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Oh, man, as a little kid, we say, my daddy can beat up your daddy. <laughs> well, I got news for you. Jesus Christ can whoop them all. He can, yeah, he can whoop them all. And he's coming again. And we need to live like Jesus in this crooked, vile, nasty, unfair world run by Satan and the demons. We need to stand out. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He knows and hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth in the spirit of error. See, there's no gray area with God. It's black darkness, it's white holiness. That's it. And we don't have time to go there. Well, throw it up on the board anyway. 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. The Bible tells us that every one of us, every one of us are going to stand before God. Christians will stand at the Bema seat. Non-Christians will be at the great white throne of judgment where you will be judged and you will be sentenced and pronounced guilty, and you will spend the rest of your life in hell. And folks, I know that sounds harsh, but that's what the Word of God says. Read Luke chapter 16, folks. Hell is a real place. But I got news for you as we close. You don't have to go there. You don't have to. You can admit that you're a sinner, you can confess your sin to Christ. You can believe that Jesus lived a perfect life that was born of a virgin, died on the cross for you. And on the third day he arose, which gives us victory over death. You can be saved today. And folks, that invitation is here. That invitation is right here. If you will, confess. Confess is coming forward, making a public profession of faith, saying, I need God more than I need anything else in my life. And the second invitation is for Christians. Folks, what are you doing? What are you doing for God? Are you reflecting Jesus' light? Are you light in your words and in your conduct and where, you're, where you go in the the people that you influence. I pray as Christians, some would rededicate their life to Christ and get back in the fight. Get back in the fight. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your word. Man, your word is always right. It is yes and it is amen. And God, I first and foremost pray, if there's one here that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. God, it's the best decision that they could possibly make. So God, I pray you would convict hearts. Thank you that we saw all the waters of baptism move. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is working here. And God, we give you this invitation. And God, I pray for the Christian. There were Christians that were doing right and doing the right thing as a minority in the church in Thyatira. God, I pray if we've fallen back, if we slipped, if we're not all that we should be, that you would convict us of our sins. And God, I pray that we would even come to this altar, even if they don't talk to us, just kneel at this altar. Make a recommitment of their life to Christ. Lord, others may need to follow the Lord in baptism or even join the church. God, this is your church. This is your time. You do with it what you choose. God, we'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you, would you come?